Uh, so the second talk will be given by Dr. Emmanuel Paladi. Dr. Emmanuel Paladi is senior researcher at IRD, but currently hosted uh, in NBT. Uh, he specializes in developing bioinformatics uh, programs, integrating and analyzing biological and ecological data. He will talk about uh, predicting uh, carbon sequestration for left coast and climate vegetation. Okay, and much better on this. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, you have the title of my talk, Predicting Carbon Sequestration, Forest Growth and Climate Mitigation, uh, which I should uh, add also uh, land use in the title. Um, you will see there, is, there will be a lot of overlap between uh, my talk and uh, Maxim's. It's perfectly normal because we are collaborating together and also we collaborate with uh, NBT on these questions. So uh, during this presentation, I will give you some background. Then I will give you an overview of the collaborations which are ongoing between uh, NSTDA and uh, IRD. And then I will focus on some results uh, also on uh, remote sensing data, like Maxim, but focused on, uh, on uh, land use. So some background, you know that already, Maxim told you, uh, we are living a climate crisis caused by the uh, emissions, uh, the production of greenhouse gases by human activities, and these greenhouse gases are ejected in, into the atmosphere, uh, causing, uh, causing a rise of temperature. Uh, during the last 52 years, it is estimated there is more than 1,500 uh, billion tons of CO2 emitted by uh, human activities. It's an average of about 30 uh, billion tons of CO2, which is equivalent to about 8 billion tons of carbon every year. So 8, this is the average every year. What is a, a less well known, but Maxim told you about that, is that a significant quantity of these emissions are captured by terrestrial ecosystems. Every year there is between, uh, this is the point here, yeah, between two and three billion tons of carbon absorbed by terrestrial ecosystems. And this process is called the carbon sink. On the other hand, around Two, but two or 2.5 billion tons of carbon are emitted by land use change and deforestation. It's about 10% of the emission of, uh, of carbon, which makes land use changes uh, the second source of uh, greenhouse gases uh, as, as, as the origin of, the, of uh, global warming. Uh, the second source after, of course, the burning of fossil fuels. So these results, this uh, shows the importance of, of uh, land use in the strategies of climate mitigation. Okay, in this context, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, attention on uh, the growth of forest, and especially tropical forest, because of the very large scale potential of this forest to capture carbon and to store this carbon on the long term. Tropical forests are especially important, Maxime told you that, because, especially because they can grow all year long, unlike temperate or boreal forests, which have a, a period of zero growth during the year. So during a previous study, we have shown that during the last 30 years, there is a trend to, of decrease and slowdown of the, for, of the rate of forest loss in Southeast Asia. But this uh, uh, convergence to uh, reforestation varies a lot depending on the country. And in some countries like, uh, sorry, uh, in some countries like Thailand, we are almost on a path of uh, forest recovery while other countries like Malaysia continue to lose forest at a significant rate. So this points to the important question, the crucial question uh, to have a, uh, an efficient strategy of carbon storage is to find what factors make that forest is, is growing in some areas or is, is not growing in other areas. This is a crucial question. 
And to address this question, we have three ongoing projects between NSTDA and IRD. The first project, BIMOMS, Biodiversity Modeling at Multiple Scales, which is led by uh, CISADES, funded by IRD with partners from NSTDA, uh, Cassette South University, IRD of course, and Burapai University. <coughs> the second project, which will start very soon, Natural Forest Law for Capture and Storage of Carbon in Natural Tropical Forests, which is funded by uh, BNP Paribas Foundation, in, uh, located in France, with uh, partners from NSTA, IRD, and Cassette Sart, and the University of Graz in Austria. And the third project, which is starting now, which is called SIMPLE, for Sustainability Issues Metaverse for Building Participatory Learning Environments. It is led by uh, my colleague, Dr. Alexis Drogoul, from IRD in, in Vietnam, and it is funded by uh, the European Commission and associate colleagues from IRD in uh, NSTDA and from Canto University in Vietnam. So all these projects address different uh, uh, questions in the different uh, fields. So the main characteristics to, of these different projects is to be multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary and uh, open science. I will come back to this uh, later. The main topics are soil microbiomes, vegetation dynamics, which has been uh, a bit uh, addressed by Maxim, uh, land use modeling, and remote sensing analysis. And in the rest of my talk, I will show how these two, uh, how we uh, use these two uh, topics, land use modeling and remote sensing in synergy. So, Remote sensing data are something which are very important in the strategies of climate change mitigation. Uh, Maxim told you a lot about, about that. I wanted to show you an overview, but I will go quick, very quickly on LIDAR. It's an, an active sensor, sorry, which is carried by an, an, uh, an aircraft typically with very high resolution data, but on a very uh, limited area. Uh, the Landsat data, also we use them because they are uh, the this is the first uh, satellite of Earth's uh, observation which has been sent by the NASA in 1972. So it makes possible to use, to reconstruct long uh, time series of vegetation dynamics. So this has been done by a paper, by this, in this paper here, which associates colleagues from uh, NBT, IRD, and Cassette State University. And here I will focus a bit more on the Sentinel program. This program is uh, run by the European Space Agencies. It started in 2014, and it is made by several satellites. The first satellite, uh, was, so I said this was uh, uh, launched in 2014, and currently there are eight satellites in orbit recording different types of data around the Earth. Uh, one of these, uh, two of these satellites are called Sentinel-2, there are two satellites of the same type, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, which record uh, um, spectral data in different bands, in the visible, but also in the infrared. And uh, the resolution of the band in the visible and the near infrared is 10 meters on, on the ground. So there are two of these satellites, and they, uh, they fly over the same location every 10 days, and they are on both opposite sides of the Earth. When one of them is uh, around here uh, near New Zealand, Australia, the other one is uh, over Europe. So it makes possible to have, uh, to record images of, uh, of the Earth of the same location every five days. But just if, uh, um, uh, just one word about this website, uh, it's very interesting because you can go on this uh, website and type the name of the satellite and it shows you live where the satellite is. So that's uh, very, uh, a bit funny to see uh, where the satellites that take this picture are uh, located. Okay, there are two things interesting about the Sentinel-2 program. One is that there is no uh, geographical limitations. All these images are recorded everywhere on, uh, on the terrestrial surface of the Earth. And the data are available in real time, actually near real time, there will be just a few hours uh, delay, on a website which is called the Copernicus uh, Open Access Hub. 
and which is maintained by the European Space Ag uh, Agency. Uh, okay, this is a map of Thailand. Uh, the blue and uh, yellow polygons are the protected areas. This has been dis discussed before um, uh, during the previous talk. And all uh, the, uh, the squares here, so in light blue, are uh, the images taken by these two satellites, Sentinel-2, and it shows the overlap of these two, uh, two satellites and the, the images with uh, the protected areas. During a period a bit more than six years, there is more than 100,000 images of Sentinel-2 which has been taken over time. So this makes a lot of data uh, available. And I will show you a, a very uh, a small example here, which is located near Kaoyai, Kaoyai here, the province of Saraburi. And I will focus on this area here to show you the, the different uh, bands and different wavelengths in uh, blue, green, red, and infrared at different times. It's possible to see some variation, but as Maxime explained uh, also, uh, we have to take into account uh, noise, we have to take into account uh, uh, errors, and at these different times, uh, uh, there could be variation due to the position of the, of the sun or to uh, small uh, uh, atmospheric disturbances. So to do this, we uh, use an um, algorithm of land use classification, which we couple with a uh, machine learning al algorithm to identify the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the special objects on the land. All these uh, analyses require a lot of data. We download the data from uh, Copernicus, and we do the small scale and model development here in NBT and the large uh, computation analysis I, are made on the Adastra supercomputer, which is uh, located in the south of France in Montpellier. I, I mentioned about open science. All the computer code that we develop for, for this program are uh, published open source. And uh, here is an example of the repository where some of the codes are published on the, the GitHub uh, repository. So the work of, uh, in progress uh, now is to implement this analysis at a uh, local scale. I show you an example with Kaoyai National Park. Also, the later we'll apply on national scale and even on, on regional scale. We will integrate the different topics, land use, biomass estimation, with uh, the, micro, uh, the study of microbiome, the vegetation analysis, to see what factors are important for the capture and storage of carbon. And Ultimately, we will develop models of, of land use to assess different carbon strategies. Yes, the take-home message is as we try to, uh, we aim to deliver advances in our understanding of forest growth uh, and the, its role in climate change mitigation. Uh, we will, uh, something I didn't present, it will, it's something which is ongoing, uh, the, the, the study of soil microbiomes and their importance in uh, carbon recycling, which has some potential bi biotechnological applications. And all this will have an impact on, uh, the, uh, on the forest, forest uh, rest restoration projects and the assessment of carbon credits in the near future. Okay? A few, I, I hope I have one or two minutes to acknowledge the contribution of NSTDA and IRD for their uh, support, institutional support over the past few years, and we, we, we aim to continue for in the near future. Uh, I need to thank also uh, my institutions uh, located in France, ISEM in Montpellier, CNRS and the University of Montpellier, and I already mentioned IRD, BNP Paribas, and uh, European uh, Foundations Open Commission for uh, financial supports. I want to, spend, to thank especially, especially also people from uh, NBT here for uh, their warm welcome and all the help in uh, all the many, many things. And thank you very much for your attention. Do not hesitate to contact people here in NBT because all this research will continue during several years. If you are interested to collaborate, to, to join, to, or just to, if you are curious to have questions, but do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, um, Emmanuel. Um, you look exactly the same as your picture. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a few years ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's my compliment. Um, you talk about the, um, the dynamics uh, or the parameters that actually make, um, make the changes in carbon sequestration. Um, the project, though, uh, involved uh, some of the measurement in terms of soil microbiomes and many other stuff, which may not have enough um, differences because basically you, you probe, like say for example today, you, you measure and then uh, later on you measure it again. Um, the ability to see changes over a short period of time may not be enough for you to discern or distinguish if that is the true parameters that would contribute to the changing. So how do you cope with this? Because uh, I don't think that the project will last for 10 years or something. And in the past 20 years, um, the measurements of whatever you propose aren't, um, ha hadn't been done yet. So you are going to do in um, prospective, not retrospective. So how do you, how do you get those uh, to be included? So just to be sure, your, your question is about microbiomes. And yes. Especially, yes, yeah, of course. I think it's a very big uh, black box right now in the, in the carbon cycle. Um, so, no, I have no uh, definite an answer on that. Uh, we, we need to learn first. Uh, when you look at the literature, uh, there is not much. We know that it has an impact. We know there is uh, uh, some things that, are, that, are, that is important. But right now, it's more like a black box than, than anything else. Well, um, I'm, I'm asking this because uh, what we are currently doing this, um, well, because we are collaborator, um, is that we, instead of looking over time, we're trying to capture different areas that uh, present different um, characteristics of the forest. So we have the old growth, we have the stem initiation, we have you know, the um, barren land, for example, and we observe the, uh, what goes on in the microbial communities among them. So we hope that we could use this uh, as the uh, parameters that would be put into your model. Would that would that be? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. And there's still uh, a lot, a lot of unknowns, uh, especially right. different types of, of microbes, but with the bacteria and uh, the fungi. Uh, how much each one is important is still something uh, very unknown. Because most studies they focus on one type or, or the other. Mm. And to have a global picture is very difficult, right? Now. Right. Right. And um, another question that I wanted to ask, actually, Maxime, uh, who was a speaker um, earlier, is that um, what we are focusing now is above ground biomass. But um, there are a lot more biomass underground. And um, in some countries, there are like a fungi that grow on the underground. And there's a huge amount of the biomass that could be considered as, um, you know, carbon uh, uh, sink. Right, but I'm not sure how much um, absorbed of the uh, carbon they have contributed in, in, in this picture because um, Maxim said that um, the water, the seawater, and also the, uh, the land, the terrestrial, actually absorb carbon differently. About a quarter has been absorbed by the uh, terrestrial, right? And, and about another quarter has been absorbed by, by that. So, so um, I was wondering if uh, you are aware of the way to actually estimate the underground biomass that uh, may give us some some uh, insights into how 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 bad we are in terms of uh, doing uh, um, in terms of the saving the world like uh, reducing the temperature 1.5 degree or something like that it seems like uh, everyone saying that we are on the highway down to hell <laughs> at the moment uh, any comments on that yes maxim you're still online? Yes, yes, I'm here. So, uh, <clears throat> so QC said this is asked a, a very good question. Okay, I have a lot to echo. Maybe, uh, Emmanuel, if you can hit, hit the mic. Yeah? Ah, yeah, it's much better. 
Uh, so th that's a very uh, interesting uh, question and um, <clears throat> uh, definitely a uh, below ground biomass is a major source of uncertainty uh, in, uh, in the global carbon pool. Um, so the way to measure that, uh, we have some way to measure typically uh, the, the, the carbon contained in the um, organic matter in, uh, in the soil and uh, we, we do also have a way to uh, estimate uh, the biomass uh, stored in the roots but it's uh, with a lot of um, uncertainty especially for the biomass in the root so typically we, we may use ground penetrating radar to estimate this biomass uh, distribution in the roots but uh, we are far from getting a very accurate estimate for now and this is very important because you have uh, a gradient so typically from uh, the tropical forest to the boreal forest uh, there is a switch of uh, the, the pool where the carbon is stored so in tropical forests uh, you have a, a lot of carbon stored in the soil but much less than in the boreal forest where most of the biomass is stored in the soil uh, because in the forest the, 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 the carbon is rapidly recycled and stored more, mostly in the, the tree uh, in the tissue of the trees so that when we are mapping above ground biomass in space we are missing a large per part of uh, uh, the, the carbon that is stored uh, below ground and that may in fact also uh, mitigate uh, the difference that we observe between ecosystems typically between a savanna and a forest most in the savanna most of the biomass will be stored below ground while in the forest most of the biomass will be stored above ground so yes, definitely this is a way for that uh, where we should make more progress. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the answer, Maxim and Emmanuel.